Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Molly Koenig. I am the chair of Live Better St. Tammany. And our goal is to create and maintain a culture of health throughout the business community of St. Tammany Parish. And we are thrilled today to have Dr. Curtis with us. He is with All American Healthcare in Covington. He'll be discussing how we can be both physically and mentally strong, how we can improve our immune system, what stressors to avoid, um, and ways to have optimal body functioning. So I'm gonna turn it over to him in just one second, but before we start, I do want you to know that this is recorded and we will send you this recording along with the presentation slides to all of the attendees. If you have any questions, you'll see the Q&A tab at the bottom. You can enter any questions and we will do our best to answer those or at least follow up with you with any um, questions you may have. So thank you so much for your time on behalf of the chamber and I will turn it over to you, Dr. Curtis. Thank you, appreciate it, Molly. Um, I've been practicing for 20 years. I'm a chiropractor, I run an integrated facility, which means we incorporate things like chiropractic care, physical therapy, um, my medical staff is more holistically oriented, naturally oriented uh, to help people with physical issues. Uh, myself and my medical director have been uh, working on a fellowship in anti-aging and functional medicine, which is more directed at trying to figure out what the cause of a problem is and, and going at it more holistically or more naturally. That's what functional medicine is. Um, so that's really... Um, my focus and um, I want to talk about you know where we are in our health care uh, throughout the nation but I also want to relate that to um, what's happening right now with COVID um, and um, you know I, I hope to shed some light on things but um, our health care in the United States, in my opinion, isn't where uh, it should be. And I, for one, want that to change. Uh, that's been, you know, our, our purpose here in the clinic is to help people, but uh, from a healthcare point of view, um, I wanna help make an impact um, in our community. And, and my personal belief is that our healthcare model really needs to change. And I'm gonna uh, show you some examples uh, today uh, of why and, and, and how that is. So I've got to use my my eyeball so I can share the screen. All right. So we're gonna start with the definition of healthcare. And um, you know, this seems pretty basic, but when you sit there and you look at the definition health the state of being free from illness or injury uh, care the provision of what's necessary for the health welfare and maintenance and protection of someone so in care uh, particular words that stick, stick out to me are uh, welfare and maintenance and protection of someone when we um, practice health care in the United States um, you know our efforts directed in that direction and um, my opinion is we gotta get a lot better at that and you'll see why. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This is the definition uh, from the World Health Organization. Um, you can see I underline not merely the absence of disease, but how do we in the United States have a tendency to judge how we're doing uh, you know, from a health point of view? Uh, I, I don't have symptoms, I feel okay, um, but we all know that you can have a disease and not necessarily feel it. So we're going to touch on that more as we go. Are we healthy in the United States? You know, we got the best doctors, the best hospitals in the world. Um, we have access to more money and more technology and more medicines. So where do we rank? And the answer is really not well. Um, we're right now uh, 37 in the world compared to all the other countries. We generally have ranked historically right in that range, 37, 38, 40. The U.S. spends more in health care, but we got worse health outcomes than comparable countries. Why is that? We're going to talk about that. Within the U.S., there's unacceptable disparities 
by uh, health, race, ethnic groups, co uh, county by county, state by state. In the U.S., even if you're rich, you have, uh, you, you're well-educated, you have the best health care, that doesn't mean that your health is going to be as good as your peers. Louisiana ranks 49 out of 50. Uh, some of the simple reasons, we got a high rate of obesity, um, poverty is an issue, uh, cardiovascular death rate. Uh, to me, that's all, uh, most of the time that's linked to obesity in the past five years. Drug deaths have increased 65% in our state alone. So some simple true or false questions right here. The U.S. has the highest infant mortality rates as well as vaccine rates. It's true. Uh, the U.S. spends more in healthcare than any other country, but has the lowest life expectancy. True. The U.S. has the highest suicide rates among the wealthy nations. True. The U.S. has among the highest number of hospitalizations from preventable causes and the highest rates of avoidable deaths. True. The U.S. has the lowest life expectancy in comparable countries. True. More than 70% 70, 70 of U.S. adults are overweight or obese. Again, it's all true. Um, if you haven't looked at these stats, to me, um, shocking. Treatment outcomes. Um, when we compare to um, comparable countries, and you can see the other countries that are there, the U.S. ranks last in a measure of healthcare access and quality. Now think about that for a second. Healthcare access and quality. Uh, and I was saying a minute ago, we got the best doctors, we got the best hospitals. Why are we having um, a lack of access and a lack of quality? I mean, there's a doctor around every corner. Um, we're going to touch on that. So, what's the biggest complaint about U.S. healthcare? Uh, the answer, in my opinion, that I hear more than anything else is cost. So, um, you know, for me, my wife, uh, we have three kids. It costs us $2,000 a month just for health insurance. That's $24,000 a year just for health insurance. And that is what I hear from patients more than anything else. I can't afford it. We have to do something about that, you know. So why are our numbers so bad? I'm going to share some interesting stats with you about that. Uh, prescription drug use in the United States, and, and, and this is the percentage of persons using at least one prescription drug in the last 30 days is 50%. So half the nation is using at least one prescription drug in the last 30 days, um, using three or more, one in four. Uh, to me, those stats are crazy, and you're going to see more about it. Uh, the number of drugs ordered uh, or provided is 2.9 billion. Percentage of visits involving drug therapy is almost 75%. And these are just some of the most frequent drug classes that are prescribed. Analgesics, that's for pain, uh, antihyperlipidemic, uh, antilipid. Lipid means fat. Uh, what we're talking about there is cholesterol drugs. Obesity is a big deal. Um, remember that 70% of our nation is overweight or obese. Um, and I'm gonna talk on uh, why that is. And then after that, skin, you know, it's how we look. So it's pain, um, obesity, and then um, dermatological. Those are the most uh, highly used prescriptions. Country comparison, and this is on pharmaceuticals between 2000 and uh, 2016. This is the United States um, compared to those other countries that we were looking at a little while ago per capita. And this graph to me um, just says a lot. Total life expectancy at birth um, between 1980 and 2017. Again, um, you can see the life expectancy there and the, the trend we are lower than these other countries. So we spend more money. Um, we got the best docs, the best hospitals. Um, we're talking our healthcare system here. Prescription drug advertising. We're only one of two nations in the world that has direct consumer advertising of prescription drugs. 
Louisiana in uh, 2019, so we don't have uh, current year stats, but obesity is up 36.8%. Uh, diabetes is up 14%. Childhood obesity, and this is according to the National Center for uh, Health and Statistics, the prevalence of childhood overweight or obesity has tripled since the 70s. Childhood overweight or obesity is responsible for 14 billion in lifetime direct medical costs or almost 20,000 per child with obesity. Um, childhood obesity is uh, epidemic. So what is the problem? Um, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a simple question. Um, a lot of times people wanna look at one area like money, for example, but it's multifactorial. Uh, money is an issue. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot more about that from a detailed point of view. Um, you know, what most people think healthcare actually is. We'll talk about that as well. Um, advertising, education, um, nutrition, lifestyle. We're going to, we're going to touch on all of these. Right now, there's a movement in our country um, to that, that being overweight is okay. And I don't want to confuse that with hey, I'm big and I'm beautiful, um, I fully support that. But from a health care point of view or from a you being healthy point of view, just simple health, being overweight is not okay. And I'm going to show you statistically why. America spent $535 billion on prescription drugs in 2018. It's an increase of 50% uh, since 2010. Big Pharma increasing prices on most prescribed medications anywhere from 40 to 71 percent between 2011 and 2015. Uh, the LA Times said that since the 30s the National Institute of Health has invested close to 900 billion of taxpayer dollars. So our, our, our taxpayer dollars are going toward research that has uh, formed both the pharma the pharmaceutical and the biotech sectors but um, despite all that money spent, why are we having to pay more for prescription drugs? It's a good question. Um, so there's an uh, article from uh, JAMA from 1997 through 2016, medical marketing expanded substantially, spending increased from 17 to 29 billion. Uh, and this goes into all the commercials that you see on TV. And remember, we're only one of two countries that does direct to consumer advertising from these drug companies. Lobbying efforts, um, you know, doing my best not to stay, not to step into the political arena, especially right now, it's a touchy subject, but um, lobbying in my opinion is a problem in our country, especially as it pertains to healthcare. Spending 4 billion over the past 22 years, the pharmaceutical and health product industry has spent the most money of all industries in lobbying. Um, from January 20 to March two, uh, 2020, the two companies that spent the most were the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America and Pfizer. And a study from JAMA showed that 233 million per year spent on presidential candidates, congressional candidates for a total of 4.7 billion from 1999 to 2018. You can look it up. You can look and see what these guys are donating to senators and congressmen. And I, when I looked it up, I was shocked uh, to see around an average of uh, about 150000 a year that they're donating to senators and congressmen. And this is one of the problems I have with lobbying. Um, if you're going to make changes in health care, um, it's Human beings have a hard time staying away from money, that dangling carrot that's sitting out there. And that's one of the reasons why I think that that needs to be addressed in our country. So, um, you know, why is our, why our health care, and I, I call our health care system disease care, because typically when it comes to health care, and, and don't get me wrong, when it comes to trauma, you know, if you're shot, you're in one of the best countries in the world. But when it comes to health care, staying healthy and getting healthy, you're not. So we have been practicing a model 
that I call disease care or symptom-based care. If you talk to your nurses and doctors out there and you ask them, and I, and I have a lot of friends in the industry and I ask them this, I'm like, what are you treating? You know, I'm not talking about orthopedic surgeons fixing broken bones and stuff like that. Um, they're gonna tell you uh, we're treating symptoms. And then look at the, how expensive it is uh, on top of that. The average cost of a knee replacement, 57,000, okay? If we start addressing these problems earlier, things like knee replacements, again, short of trauma, a lot of these issues can be prevented. Uh, cost of rotator cuff repairs, 21,000. Pain management program is uh, 5,000. And, and the stats that I've read, the numbers that you see here are conservative. A spinal fusion, 26,000. I've seen numbers up to uh, 200,000 out in California. Go a gastric bypass, twenty-five thousand, and uh, and then uh, you know I had to I had to put the chiropractic plug in there. The cost of six months of chiropractic care, fifteen hundred dollars. Um, preventative care is a lot cheaper. Total pharmaceuticals uh, spending in U.S. dollars in 2016 compared to other countries. When you see it on a graph like this, you know compared to Japan, Germany, France, Canada, Sweden, it's staggering. My opinion is we have got to change Western medicine. So where's our future going to be? In the 30s, almost half of the medical students uh, were practicing holistic health care. Um, you know, the, where did that change? Um, it really started with the advent of the pharmaceutical industry, and that money continues to drive us down that road. So part of my purpose is to help educate um, our public on where that is and hopefully where um, we should and need to go in my opinion. What's the biggest impact on our health? Stress. Well, when I say stress, you know, what does that mean? Um, I hear patients say, I'm, you know, I'm stressed out. There's different types of stress. Um, stress defined in a, a few different ways. It's an organism's response to any stressor. It's the rate of wear and tear or uh, on the body as a result of anxiety, worry, exhaustion from a difficult or challenging situation or experience. It's a difficult or intense experience, which if prolonged can cause irritation to your body's system, the nervous system, the musculoskeletal system. Um, an example right there is repetitive motion disorders, but there's three different types of stress and they are simply physical, chemical, and emotional. And uh, some examples of physical could be um, accidents, injuries, falls, uh, repetitive motion at work, um, you know, just sitting at a computer for hours and hours a day. That's a stress on your low back. It's a stress on your hands and wrists. You know, an end result, just to give you an example, can be low back pain um, or carpal tunnel. Um, chemical, it's um, a chemical stressor on our body. Uh, common sense things like uh, smoking, um, drinking, you know, alcohol is a chemical stressor on the body. It depresses your immune system. Uh, here's another chemical stressor that is probably uh, not going to be real popular when I say this, but coffee. Coffee causes the release of adrenal stress hormones into your body. And that's just to give you some examples. Emotional or psychological stressors you know, it's work, it's kids, it's um, loss of a loved one, it's finances, it's all of that stuff. It's the emotional, the psychological portion. And all of these can impact your health. So how does stress affect your life? Well, the American Academy of Family Physicians estimates that 60% of the conditions brought to physicians in the U.S. are stress-related. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say it's higher than that, because when you think about it, physical, chemical, and emotional stress, the way I just defined it, um, almost covers just about everything you can think of. More than three quarters of adults report physical or emotional symptoms of stress, such as headaches, feeling tired, fatigue, uh, changes in sleep habits. Sleep's really important because um, that's when your body heals itself. It's uh, when you regenerate. And emotional stress, fear and worry can stop you from sleeping like you should. Uh, nearly half of adults say they have laid awake at night because of stress the prior month. 
Um, so what stresses do Americans suffer from the most? You know, really it's a combination. Uh, and again, some simple examples, but uh, physical, 20% of Americans uh, say they feel pain every day. Over two thirds of all deaths in the United States are caused by chronic disease. People age 45 and over are more likely to suffer from low back pain. Americans with chronic pain have uh, a, a sleep deficit of 42 minutes. Chronic low back pain is the most common type of chronic pain. 50% of adults claim to suffer uh, from chronic headaches, half of us. Um, you know, headaches, as an example, um, a lot of times we ask patients, hey, what do you think is normal for headaches? And, you know, I'll, I'll hear answers like three or four a week, one to two a week. Even if you get one a week, that's 52 a year. What's a headache? A headache is an end result of something being wrong in your body. Studies show that over 80% of headaches come from the neck. So if there's a problem in the neck, it causes a headache, for example. Okay. And um, what is a headache? A headache is a symptom. Symptoms are your body's way of telling you something's wrong. Okay. But symptoms, the problem with symptoms is this. We have to go through a breakdown process for symptoms to show up. And again, that's um, not including trauma. Migraine uh, is the third most common illness worldwide. So what stressors do we suffer from? It's in the chemical and emotional category. Um, chemical, again, uh, sugar. You know, another word for sugar is carbohydrate. One of the biggest problems in our state and in our country is obesity. And the number one cause is sugar, also known as carbs. I wanna encourage everyone to start reading labels and look at where these carbs are coming from. Prior to World War II, the average American ate 20 pounds of sugar a year. Now the average is between 150 and 200 pounds a year. So, and, and that's in the United States. So why are our obesity rates so high? It's sugar. And by the way, alcohol is a sugar. Um, some other examples of the chemical plastics, toxins, um, if you talk to some of the uh, cancer docs out there, they're going to tell you our cancer rates are, are just continue to climb. Um, emotional issues, we touched on those. Hormones can be a, a factor. Genetic, genetic issues can be a factor, of course. Family work and money. So how does Western medicine try to address these issues? You know, the physical, uh, pain management, um, steroids, conservative therapies, um, like physical therapy, chiropractic care um, are some examples there. Uh, chemical, steroids, antibiotics to give you some examples and the emotional, uh, Prozac, Ritalin, Adderall, Xanax, just to name a few. So there's different types of healthcare. And if you actually try to do research um, on the internet on the different types of healthcare, the different types of healthcare are described within our model. Our model is what you see here on the left. It's what I call symptom-based care or relief care. Our current model is money-driven. So when you talk about the different types of healthcare in the United States, it's called private pay. Socialized medicine um, is medi Medicare, Medicaid, uh, and cash. That's how it's broken down. So I'm trying to present to you some different types of healthcare or a different way to think about it. Um, our current model, symptom-based care or relief care versus um, what we call full functional care or preventative medicine. We're talking about getting healthy and staying healthy. We're talking about preventing problems down the road. <clears throat> and we're gonna get into that. This is just a graph that, you know, if, if if I apply this to someone that walked into my office, um, if you look across the bottom left to right, it says assessment, treatment, recovery, and then and then maintenance down the road. If you follow the the red trail, um, as we or if you look on the left hand side as you go up and you stabilize people, um, that is an area where people start to get out of pain. We start treating people whether it may be like neck uh, issues, headaches 
a shoulder, low back, knees, you name it, um, as they start to feel better, what do people think? People think, well, I feel better, I must be okay. Well, if the problem's not fixed, what happens? So in other words, if you just take, um, the, you're that person that gets that headache a couple of times a week and you take some Tylenol and the Tylenol covers up the headache, the headache goes away, but does it really go away? Is it really fixed? Well, does the headache come back? Yes, yeah, it's happening two, three times a week. So the headache comes back. So the problem's not fixed. What are we doing? We're riding that roller coaster. That's what symptom-based care or relief care is. Get out of pain, go away, come back. Get out of pain, go away, come back. The problem with that is when you look at that over your lifespan or over the course of years, you have a degenerative problem that is not getting fixed. When you don't fix the problem, as we get older, unfortunately, we degenerate. And as we degenerate, guess what happens to the problem? The problem simply gets worse. So the headaches go from once a week to twice a week to three times a week to every day. And again, that's just using uh, one example. But I hope this shows you the difference because imagine if you could get rid of your issues, get yourself and if you look to the left-hand side on this graph, you see something, um, a, a word that's called optimizing. Optimize your health. Really, that's what anti-aging is all about. It's about optimizing your health. It's staying healthy, uh, being at your best, living your best life versus the model we've been living in. And again, I think it needs to change. Our medical model is upside down, just like our food pyramid, and we're going to talk more about that. So. How does this impact us um, with the coronavirus? Um, what's your immune system like? I gotta tell you, since this virus has started, not one time have I worried about it for me personally, um, for my kids. Now, if you ask me um, if, my grand, you know, if my grandparents were living and they were in their 80s, would I be worried for them? Yeah, that's a different story. And we're gonna talk about that. But if your immune system's in good shape, the stats show you don't need to worry. The human coronavirus was first identified in the 60s. Um, it was named uh, for its appearance, which is when you look at it under a microscope, it has a crown-like covering. Uh, there's different kinds of coronaviruses. There's four main subgroups, and there are seven that can infect people. And this uh, is basically how the word ba uh, breaks down corona. Uh, the, the VI parts, virus, the D is disease. The 19 is uh, for the year. So that's where COVID-19 came from. Uh, the stats for COVID uh, globally since September 22nd, um, and I gotta help, uh, well, I gotta, I gotta thank Logan for helping me get some of these stats together. Um, but there's been uh, 31 million confirmed cases of COVID, including over uh, 900,000 deaths. Uh, reported by the WHO. Uh, the U.S., 6 million confirmed with uh, right around 200,000 deaths. I think most people are aware of those stats. Um, 161 plus positive cases statewide since March and um, close to 7,000 cases reported to date in St. Tammany Parish. Eight out of 10 COVID-19 deaths reported in the United States have been Adult 65 years or older. Um, that's that right there uh, just says a lot. Eight out of 10 deaths reported have been 65 years old or older. We're gonna to touch on that. If you look at the yellow line across uh, this particular graph right here, you can see it starts, it's, it's age groups, zero to four, five to 17, all the way out to the right, you get 85 years old. On the left-hand column, you've got hospitalizations and death. This is COVID-19 hospitalization death by age, okay? And you have a comparison group, which sits third from the left. It's the 18 to 29 year old group, okay? Why, um, why are they the comparison group? Um, a simple assumption is that their immune system is going to be at its peak, okay? Um, if you look to the left of that, you see the 0 to 4 and 5 to 17. Well, 
why is the zero to four four times lower in hospitalization um, compared to the five to 17, which is nine times lower? Why is the death rate zero to four nine times lower where five to 17 is 16 times lower? The zero to four age group, their immune system hasn't had a chance to build up. It takes time uh, for our immune system to build up once we're born. We have to be introduced to different bacteria and different viruses and our body responds to that uh, by building antibodies. That's why the immune system goes up. And then what happens as we get into our 30s is you look to the right of the chart, your immune system starts to drop. Well, if you go over to the 65 to 74 year old group, it's five times higher, where it's 90 times higher a death rate. When you go to the 75 to 84 group, it's eight times higher hospitalization, where it's 220 times higher death rate. So it's really all about our immune system. What makes these people more susceptible? And it's basically comorbidities. You know, the, the, the folks that are on that right-hand side. And one of the big problems is here in the United States, we don't take such good care of our health. Comorbidities is the simultaneous presence of two chronic diseases um, in one patient. And comorbidities are associated with worse outcomes, um, more clinical management, increased health care costs. In the United States, 80% of Medicare spending is devoted to people that have four or more chronic conditions, 80%. Comorbidities in COVID-19 among patients hospitalized due to COVID-19 between March and April in the U.S., one third of patients had at least one underlying condition. 78% of ICU admissions and 94% of deaths had underlying conditions. 40% of, diabe uh, of the diabetes or uncontrolled uh, hyperglycemia. Death rates were four times higher with patients with diabetes or hyperglycemia compared to the patients without either condition. So when you look at the evidence, um, diabetes is one of the more important uh, comorbidities. When you talk about type 2 diabetes, there's something um, that is a precursor, and we're going to talk about that. All right. So what do you think the highest risk category is? Now, this graph, if you look from left to right, um, and this is really uh, for hospitalization, uh, risk for hospitalization if you have any of these conditions, asthma, one and a half times. So this we know is a virus that affects the lungs, okay? So a lot of times people would think, well, okay, asthma's gotta be high up there. It's not, it's actually one of the lower. Hypertension's higher. Obesity is higher, diabetes is higher, chronic kidney disease is higher. What's the highest? Um, when you look at one single condition, it's severe obesity. Severe obesity leads to so many other problems, and we're gonna talk about that too. But uh, beyond that, uh, two conditions is four and a half times higher, three or more conditions, uh, five times higher. This is hospital uh, admissions for chronic conditions when you uh, compare to like or comparable countries. It's just higher in the US. COPD, congestive heart failure, diabetes. Um, obesity is one of the leading causes of preventable life years lost among Americans. So one study estimates the medical cost of obesity to be 342 billion. Uh, beyond direct medical costs, the indirect cost uh, of decreased productivity tied to obesity is estimated at eight and a half billion per year. We lose work days, um, and that's really what they're talking about there. This is a country comparison. It's the prevalence of obesity when you compare us um, using a BMI over 30, and this is um, from uh, stats in 2016, the United States is 40%. The comparable country average is 17%. Obesity rates continue to trend up in the US. So at the bottom of the graph starts 99, 2000. And as we go up, uh, I think these stats on this one comes out every uh, two to three years. So we don't have the recent stats yet, but um, it just go it's going up and up and up. Um, we really need to change our system, our education, um, and that's one of the main reasons I wanted to do this. 
Obesity in Louisiana, we rank 47 out of 50 states. Um, it wasn't but a year or two ago, we were last. 36.8% uh, of Louisiana adults have a body mass index of 30 or higher. Childhood obesity, we rank 32 out of 50. Um, it's not good. Over 250 million kids will be obese by 2030 is uh, an estimate. So you remember I said that obesity is a, a precursor um, to all these other comorbidities. Diabetes type two, um, hypertension, cancer, uh, liver disease, heart disease, they all start with obesity. Type two diabetes, it's estimated that 85% of people with type two diabetes are overweight. Um, and it, it, as, as that percentage goes up um, with the BMI, it, the hospitalization goes up, especially when we're talking about uh, COVID-19. Combine that with increase in age, it, the stats get worse. In a paper published in the Journal of Cell Metabolism, research has found that among uh, 7,337 Chinese patients diagnosed with COVID-19, well-controlled blood sugar was correlated with a much lower mortality rate um, even uh, if they had type 2 diabetes. Uh, so what can we do to protect ourselves against COVID-19? Well, our leadership at local and national levels has uh, been doing uh, mask wearing, social distancing, quarantining. When's the last time you heard of uh, some research or factual evidence on immune system boosting? What's the percentage of um, us who have been exposed or will be exposed to COVID-19? Unless you've been really hermiting yourself up in your house it's a hundred percent if you get out in public if you go into the grocery store you have been exposed we need to rely mostly on our own immune system to fight this disease we don't need to rely on anyone else to protect ourselves to be healthy so what makes a strong immune system the immune system is precisely that it's a system it's um, a bunch of different parts working together in balance. The immune system's complicated. Um, it includes our hormones, uh, you know, and, and all the systems that go along with that. And these systems that are in our body work together to fight off disease, to fight off viruses, um, whether you're exposed or not. And actually, when we're exposed to viruses, that's the body's natural way of building immunity. Um, as a kid, I got the mumps, I got the measles, um, and then once I got those, um, I didn't have to worry about it anymore. My body had the immunity to fight it. Metabolic health is defined as having the ideal levels of the following, and this is without using medication. Blood sugar, triglycerides, HDL is the high density lipoproteins, that's the good cholesterol, the LDLs are the bad uh, artery clogging cholesterol, blood pressure and waist uh, circumference. Now, even people with normal weight seem to be developing diseases that are usually correlated with obesity. So what does that tell you? Lifestyle factors play a large part in metabolic health. Metabolic health is important. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, you may have heard of, you know, the guy was a marathon runner. He looked great. He was in great shape but he died of a heart attack. He wasn't metabolically healthy. And again, that's just an example, but you get the point. How many American adults are in optimal metabolic health? 12.2%. It's low. Um, and we've got to change that. How are we going to change it? We've got to start changing our system and our education and ounce of prevention is the cure. So how do you become healthier? Um, how to improve your metabolic health? You can get an annual physical. You look at those markers, but you you can look at them, but they're not going to change if you don't do anything. You've got to make changes in your diet and your lifestyle. Um, I know that smoking is one of the um, most addictive things out there. Um, I honestly marvel at it still being legal just because of that addictive property. I, I marvel at the number of people that still smoke knowing what we know that it just basically kills you um so that's kind of a no-brainer eating a diet rich in vegetables the phytonutrients and plants 
A plant-based diet has been shown to reverse heart disease by uh, some world-renowned cardiovascular surgeons. Um, maintaining a healthy weight, exercising, improving your uh, sleep hygiene. But you, to improve your sleep hygiene, you got to address those areas, uh, those emotional stressors. Although immune system health not publicized often, it's our best defense against the disease. Um, it's, it's just simply that. So how can you boost your immunity now? It's not simple. It takes time. It's not an overnight process. Um, you know, I feel comfortable because of my knowledge base. I know that my immune system is in good shape. Um, but if you're not, you know what? It's not too late to change. It is multifactorial. Stress, overall health, metabolic health, putting all those things together. And remember, remember there's physical, chemical, and emotional stress, addressing those emotional stressors. Um, some examples of that, uh, yoga, meditation, prayer, um, talking to someone uh, from an emotional standpoint, releasing those problems. So you gotta look at the natural ways to boost your immune system. Sunlight, 30 minutes a day produces vitamin C. You should be drinking half your body weight in ounces of water a day. If you're out in the sun or exercising, that goes up to 0.66. Exercise is important, but remember sometimes you can't exercise because you hurt. You have to address those issues physically. Um, we gotta change our, our diet. Uh, you know, This is a typical public school lunch, and if you just counted the carbs that were in here, uh, it's really off the chart. Um, starting from the pudding to the chocolate milk to the bread to the, to the potatoes, pretty much everything on the plate is sugar with the exception of the beef patty and a little bit of protein and fat um, in the milk and the, uh, the patty. We got some other things to worry about too. It's what they're putting in our food, not just the food itself. Now, um, Quaker strawberry and cream oatmeal, that's healthy for you, right? wrong 27 grams of sugar um sugar remember is one of the biggest problems when it comes to obesity but if you look further you see things like red 40 um all these preservatives we've got to get this stuff out of our food uh this is america's fruit loops versus canada i'm just gonna i get you know my, my kids might want this but um I, I do my best to fight this kind of stuff from even coming into my house just because of the things that you see um, and the stats that I've seen. Um, red 40, blue one, yellow six, uh, these things aren't good for us. Same thing, um, again, not a healthy snack here, but you can see the ingredients in the US versus the UK version. Uh, again, with just simple tomato ketchup. You know, you got tomato concentrate, but after that it's high fructose corn syrup, corn syrup. That is sugar. So what can you do? Be prepared, get informed, get educated, do your research, start shopping on the outside of the grocery aisles in the whole food sections, uh, lots of veggies, lots of fruits and veggies, um, lean protein, stay away from the fried foods, worry more about your immune system and taking care of your body. And that's what that means. Uh, let's worry more about what's going on behind the mask. Studies have found that a dietary change can rapidly and substantially improve cardiovascular risk factors. So I saw uh, this one cardiovascular surgeons um, did an angiogram on a patient, had a complete blockage in the what they call the widowmaker artery, offered the guy, um, he said he could crack his chest open, do a bypass or um, alternative therapies. The alternative therapy was a plant-based diet. He went on it for a year, did an angiogram after the year, and that artery was clean and clear. And he showed that on angiogram. It was on a TED talk. His name's Caldwell Esselstein. Um, you got to address those physical stressors, stressors such as pain, aching joints before they become big problems. A physical solution is best for a physical problem. You have to invest in self-care. I've approached, well, I'm 50. And um, now I stretch more than I ever have. I stretch in the morning, I stretch after I work out, I stretch when I get home in the evening. Um, and I'm just giving you an example there. This is our COVID supplement recommendations, immune support, um, focusing on zinc, vitamin D, C, uh, zinc or 
chlorotate uh, and picolinate uh, tend to be best absorbed. Um, and that's uh, from a maintenance standpoint versus like if somebody's deficient, you know, you, you might need more. If you're low on vitamin D, a lot of times now doctors are starting to prescribe vitamin D. Vitamin D helps your body absorb other vitamins. And a lot of times um, you can lead to other disease processes if you don't address that. Um, the first randomized control study on vitamin D has just been published. The results were astounding. Vitamin D nearly abolish the odds of requiring treatment in ICU. Vitamin D may actually abolish the risk of death from COVID. Um, expressed uh, as relative risk, vitamin D reduce the risk of ICU admissions 25 times. Uh, put another way, it eliminates 96% of the risk of ICU admissions. Um, expressed as an odds ratio, vitamin D reduce the odds of ICU admissions by 98%. So um, if I'm not out in the sun, at least 30 minutes every day, I, I take vitamin D every day. And it was along that maintenance scale, that uh, that 1000 IU. Um, you can up that during times of stress or documented low levels and you need to uh, get blood work to get that done. Exercise recommendations. So this is American College of uh, Sports Medicine and the CDC, 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic. Act. So what you have to do is you got to get your heart rate up, um, for 30 minutes. It may take you 10, 15 minutes to get warmed up and get your heart rate up. Uh, but when you do 30 minutes five times a week, that's 150 minutes. Um, two times a week for muscle, but that's per muscle group. So unless you're doing, a, you can do a whole body twice a week, or a lot of times people break it into, uh, me personally, I'll do push pull like chest and back. That's one day. Uh, legs is another day. Uh, so you break it up by body part. But these are the ex exercise recommendations. We have to get moving. Uh, nothing replaces hard work and dedication. This um, particular slide right here is a little near and dear to me. It was put together by Thomas Edison. It says, the doctor of the future will no longer treat the human frame with drugs, but rather will cure and prevent disease with nutrition. And what is most interesting about this to me, um, besides the fact that Thomas and Thomas Edison said it a really long time ago, is we now have the studies that prove that this is true. So what's it going to be like if you didn't have your health? You know, God only gave us one body. If you think about that, um, you know, think about it like this. Uh, what if you only had one car the rest of your life? Would you take good care of it? You know, the obvious answer is absolutely you would. But um, when it comes to our body, we don't necessarily always put that attention on it that it needs optimal health's a journey it's not a destination life's a marathon not a sprint so i want to encourage each of you to um, get on that journey uh, to make a change if you're not already there um, if you need any help reach out to me and i'd be happy to help i hope you guys enjoyed the presentation and at this point i'm hoping i can figure out how to answer questions <laughs> Q and A. Okay, boom. So I got a uh, anonymous question. Do you think consumers are not aware of the high cost of prescriptions, especially for prescriptions advertised on television? I just saw the uh, cost an X cost over five thousand a month. Um, you know, I think some are because the the people that may not have insurance co coverage that covers those prescriptions. I know that they're aware of it. We know that these uh, pharmaceutical companies have been driving up their costs. You've been seeing that with uh, different diabetes medications, um, just for example. Um, but uh, I do believe that there are a lot of people that are not aware of the cost, especially people who have just been going through life. They're busy. You know, they've had health insurance. Maybe their health insurance is through uh, their work or something, and they just go get their prescription filled. And over the years, the, the cost just goes uh, up and up. So um, I hope that helps. And I think that is about all. Okay, let's see. Can... So Molly and my, did I mess anything up or are we good? 
You did great. Can you hear me now? I can. I can. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Curtis, for your time. That was so informative, and I know I learned a lot and have some takeaways that I could definitely apply to my life. So we appreciate your time. Um, for those of you that attended, you will be getting this recording, like I stated, and, and the slides that he provided as well, which are very helpful. If you have any further questions, um, you could certainly reach out to us. We'll be sending you that email. We can get you in touch with Dr. Curtis, but we'll ensure that you have his contact information as well in the Molly, following. Molly, I do email. have um, a question that just popped up okay. from uh, Thomas. Hi, Thomas. Um, there's a wide variety of brands of vitamins on the market. Which are best? It's a very good question. Um, it's not a simple answer. And the reason why is this, um, the way I refer to it when I'm talking to a patient is, you know, you can go to Walmart and get the Walmart brand. Uh, if you look a little deeper, some of the um, vitamins out there have um, petroleum products in it, uh, preservatives, things like that. I get my supplements from high quality labs. For instance, if you um, read my multivitamin, it says no yeast, no wheat, no uh, dairy, no soy, no artificial preservatives, flavorings, or colorings. Go try to find a, a vitamin that says that. So the point is you got to do some research. GNC, you know, it, it is really well known, but they have, in my uh, opinion, you got to read the labels. Um, I don't want to talk bad about anybody, but you do need to read the labels. But I am a, of the firm of opinion that we should be taking supplements. Our, our, the nutrition that we get from our foods isn't of the quality that it used to. Our soils are depleted. Um, the, the farmers are having to turn the, the crops over and, and the crops get the nutrients from the soil. You know, if you go to other countries like Europe, for example, you know, you'll see these big manure trucks constantly out there spraying the fields where we're using chemicals, pesticides, uh, chemical fertilizers. Um, and in my opinion, that is a contributing factor to why our cancer rates are higher. And that's why the studies are now showing that it's better to eat organic. But, you know, I've seen a picture, you know, of the McDonald's cheeseburger and fries, like $1.99, and you got the organic salad, it's like 15 bucks. It's more expensive. It really is. It's a shame. That's another thing that I think needs to change. Um, but the only way it's going to change is if we demand it. Perfect. Thank you for noticing that. And any other questions before we wrap it up? Um, all right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Curtis, for your time. Thank you to all of those that attended today. And stay tuned as we provide more education um, throughout the rest of the year. Happy to help. I uh, hope thank you guys you. enjoyed it. Have a great day. Bye-bye.